It's been a little while since I posted a video because my health has been absolutely terrible over this last month and it was pretty bad over the last couple weeks here. So for the uh, first video that I'm going to be doing today for coming back from being sick so long, I'm going to do a video on 15 weapons and munitions for producing during a conflict so this is not going to be stuff you're going to work on beforehand and stock up this is stuff that you should do to support a resistance during a conflict now out of most of this what you do for right now for these is gather information Download videos, down, download uh, articles, manuals, <clears throat> copy pages off of websites that talk about this stuff. Get as much information as you can. Uh, some items you'll want to get a hold of maybe demilitarized examples to have on hand that you can look at to use as patterns. But... Uh, I'll first start off with saying always follow laws in your area especially with firearms that varies greatly across the country uh, if you get uh, any full automatic parts to use as examples for future production do not store those with your firearms or other semi-automatic weapons parts you have to keep those separate and preferably in a different location than the semi-auto stuff. If you store it near those weapons or with those parts, that can be constru construed in court as an intent to produce an illegal fully automatic weapon. Now, the first th item I have on here is AR-15s and M16s. This is obviously something you can produce now. You can produce semi-automatic AR-15s now with using 80% receivers. And I recommend you do that. Okay, manufacture a couple of them now so that you understand some of the process that goes into producing them. And then have some additional parts on hand for producing more after a conflict would begin. This is one of them where you might want to get a hold of some of the full auto parts and have those stored at a separate location that you can use as examples for production of those parts after a conflict has began so you can mass produce rifles for the militia, for the resistance. Examples of uh, some of the parts that you would have to get for, say, an M16A1 or an M16A2 or M16A4. You'll need to have disconnectors. You'll need to have the full auto trigger, full auto fire selector, sears. Springs, I've been told, are different between semi-autos and full autos, but I'm not totally sure on that. And the bolt carrier. Those are major items that, when you look at, are considerably different than... Oh yeah, and the hammer. Those items are considerably different between the semi-auto and the full auto parts. So you can't take a semi-auto part and easily convert it to a full auto part especially with the uh, bolt carriers. Now, manuals that you should have on hand for if <coughs> you're thinking about possibly producing some of these after a conflict would begin. For the M16A1, the technical manual is 9 dash. 1005 249 
and then it would be either a dash 10, a dash 20, or a dash 30 level, a dash 34. The dash 10 is the basic operator's maintenance, the basic rifleman. The 20 level and the 30 level are for higher level. That's for your unit armor or for higher level maintenance. Now for the M16A2, A4, and also the M4, it is TM9-1005-1. And then it would be either dash 10, dash 20, or dash 34. <clears throat> Make sure to get as much information as you can on all of these uh, things I'm giving you. <clears throat> now, next up, we have Sten guns. The reason I'm recommending the Sten gun and not uh, M3 grease gun is primarily ammunition. The Sten guns were designed for or chambered for 9mm Parabellum which is the most common pistol cartridge around the world. There are tons of Sten gun kits on the market, demilled kits, um, which basically involve the receivers being chopped up but a lot of the uh, full auto internals and all that stuff are still part of the kits. The reason for that is when you make a semi-automatic Sten gun, you use the same internals, but the milling you do on the receiver is a little bit different and it traps the selector in the semi-automatic mode. Uh, most people don't realize a Sten gun can fire in semi-automatic and it can fire in fully automatic. Uh, just like with the AR-15s, I recommend Try putting together an example or two of the Sten gun in semi-automatic so that you learn what to do for welding the, up, the uh, receiver tube to the lower receiver and stuff like that. Learn how to uh, mill out the different uh, holes and ports required on the receiver tube. Uh, also, I recommend on that getting hold of a bunch of magazines. There are a lot of Sten Gun magazines on the market. Uh, they kind of come in uh, batches. A large amount of them will come into the United States and then the price goes down on them. As the magazines get bought out, the price goes back up. There are 20 and 32 round magazines that are sold for the Sten Gun. Now be advised, the 20 round magazines are 32 round magazines that have been modified by putting four wires inside the housing of the magazine to restrict it from a double feed down to a single feed or single column feed for the ammunition, thus restricting it from 32 down to 20 rounds. You can restore a 20 round magazine to 32 round. Uh, there are videos on YouTube on how to do it and it was surprising to me how easy it is to do that. So try to get a hold of what information you can get on it, download some of the uh, semi-automatic build videos on it which will give you some of the information that could be helpful if you would have to produce fully automatic ones after a conflict would begin after shit would hit the fan. Now the reason I recommend uh, having some stens on hand is for vehicle crewmen and also people that would require shorter shorter length weapons which could be your special operations and that type of stuff maybe having one or two inside a squad for use for clearing out enemy fighting positions <coughs> and that way you would free up a uh, rifle now the next one I have on here is another firearm that can be produced in semi-automatic because there are parts kits out there there's not as many as there used to be. The MG42 and if you change out a few parts on it you can change it to 7.62 NATO making it an MG3. Now same as with the other two weapon systems produce one or two in semi-automatic so you learn the procedures behind it and have 
parts and uh, associated equipment and manuals and all that <clears throat> that you can use for possible production of the uh, fully automatic ones after things would after a conflict would begin after you know the fecal matter hits the uh, oscillating device <clears throat> please forgive me I'm still sick but I'm almost over it next up is ammunition and for that I'm not just talking reloading reloading is definitely a skill we have to have in our units but I remember watching a documentary years back I'll say it was almost 20 years ago now on the uh, Jewish resistance in British occupied Palestine immediately after World War II and one of the things they showed in this video when they were talking to the veterans that were still alive uh, from the resistance they had set up their own workshops, their own production facilities for manufacturing Sten guns and magazines and also 9mm ammunition. They got a hold of machine equipment for doing it by buying it from uh, Europe. Surplus stuff. <clears throat> and they would uh, build full up ammunition production facilities where they would take brass discs stamped them into brass cups which were then drilled out and milled out to produce the cartridge casing which then was cleaned up then it was primed and loaded and turned into ammunition now the ammunition workshops at least the one that they featured in this video they had located it underneath a laundry service by doing it that way, they figured no one would notice the additional uh, power that was being required for use by this machine equipment. And uh, reportedly, that particular workshop that they showed was never found. I think, think they had said that none of the ammunition production workshops they had set up anywhere in the country had ever been found because of how well camouflaged and stuff they did it. By doing that, by locating it underneath a location that was already drawing a lot of power for existing equipment it was already making a lot of noise so no one would notice you know <coughs> the um, equipment stamping out cartridge cases or drilling out receivers and that, and that stuff so get as much information as you can on ammunition along with reloading equipment and so forth Next up here, we have <coughs> claymores and claymorettes. Claymore mines <coughs> have been copied all over the world. The uh, version that they primarily copied is the M18A1 claymore mine. There was an M18 claymore mine that came out at the end of the Korean War. It was in the inventory for just a little while. It was improved on very quickly to the M18A1. <coughs> They're extremely easy to make and extremely effective. <coughs> now a Claymoreette, you're probably wondering what that is. That is a light fighter thing. That uh, engineer who had served in, or in the 82nd Airborne had told me about. He said that uh, <coughs> they the engineers could not get a hold of many claymores for some reason but what they were able to get a hold of obviously was C4 so they came up with their own miniaturized version of a claymore and the housing they used for it believe it or not was the individual cereal boxes you would get at breakfast and that's about as much information as I'm going to give you on that you can either figure it out on your own or look it up but um, they could carry two or three of those claymorettes that would weigh about the same as a single M18A1 claymore mine. Next we have fragmentation grenades. Now everybody, and I talked to a subscriber about this here after I posted the Anzac uh, Jam Tim grenade video. 
Everyone always fixates on, on uh, pipe bombs. But that's not the first type of hand grenades that were created. The first hand grenades were clay pots that were impregnated or mixed in with the clay. They would mix in pieces of metal or rocks and then they would fill the inside of the clay pot with black powder and then they would put a plug over the top and use a rudimentary fuse to set it off. Now a lot of people don't realize that the Japanese at the end of World War II they uh, regressed back to that basic with their production of hand grenades in uh, 1945 and they were produced hundreds of thousands of those small clay pots small clay hand grenades and they had them all over the Japanese islands a lot of those were captured by the groups that became the Japanese Mafia the Japanese Yakuza now another thing you could uh, think about is uh, simple cast iron hand grenades or cast steel hand grenades probably cast iron something along the lines of a British Mills bomb hand grenade uh, look it up they used them from World War one till roughly the 1980s where basically you uh, cast the body you had a large opening on one end that was sealed with a plug well there was stuff where the uh, initiation system was inserted through that plug also on the early models of the Mills bomb but if you look at the stuff it would not be that hard to do with a uh, metalworking workshop that has a um, metal f metal melting furnace and stuff like that so that you can cast so in that case it would be good to have a few uh, bodies or a general idea of uh, what you would like to use as your example for making them if you go the cast route um, Inter interesting note, I found out that in World War II, in the beginning, in 1941 for the Russians, areas that were cut off from the Red Army, they were producing their own fragmentation grenades by taking existing ones from the factory, using those as examples and making crude versions of them. By casting it themselves, making their own explosive fillers, their own rudimentary fuses and stuff. Now next up here we have thermite grenades. Thermites is, is extremely, extremely easy to make. It's really only uh, <clears throat> two uh, components and I can talk about this because this is not against the law. It's an incendiary, not an explosive. The components are iron oxide or rust powder and aluminum powder. Those are mixed together, put inside a casing, you set up a way to ignite it, and then it goes off, it starts burning. These would be handy for destroying captured vehicles and supplies that we would not be able to evacuate from the battlefield. Basically, you know, pull out one of those homemade thermite grenades put it over a vulnerable place on say an engine block or fuel tank whatever depending on the fuel some fuel won't burn unless it's extremely hot so even thermite won't set it off <coughs> you ignite it and uh, let it burn and destroy the equipment next item is the Panzerfaust this is the granddaddy of disposable anti-tank rockets now it's not that easy to find free in information that's out there on this so you're probably going to end up having to pay for books and manuals or translated manuals on them but one thing i figured with the panzerfaust is they were very easy to produce the germans produced millions of them especially late in the war when their production facilities were getting bombed out well, even with that going on, they were still able to pump out Panzerfausts by the thousands per day. <coughs> so we could take, potentially take, the basic Panzerfaust and do updates of it using information from Russian RPGs. 
so information on their warheads and that stuff to update it next we have mortars the rounds and the launchers the launchers are extremely easy to make the rounds not so much uh, it used to be said that uh, <clears throat> Gorillas and terrorists could never produce a viable mortar round, but on some of the video footage I've seen out of Syria and out of Ukraine, that's being done. They figured out a way to produce those rounds now and use them out of their own launchers. So check into that. Next one up. would be rifle grenades now for this I'm thinking primarily US World War II designs uh, something you can get a hold of very very easily and is not against the law because it's a, uh, a relic and it's not uh, a piece of ordinance in any way shape or form get a hold of some M1 A2 rifle grenade adapters those <coughs> were a basic little sheet metal thing that you attached a fragmentation grenade to and you would launch from a rifle making it a rifle grenade now rifle grenades are extremely handy we may not always be able to get a hold of 40 millimeter or 30 millimeter grenades for current launchers there are a lot of rifle grenade launchers out there on the market for like the uh, M1 Grenade Grand for Yugoslavian SKS's and other weapon systems get a hold of a few of those for your unit for whatever weapons you have <coughs> and figure out a way to make rifle grenades to use with those launchers obviously don't produce the rifle grenades now wait till after the conflict would begin all of this should be done post or during a conflict after it has begun not before next up we have rockets and launchers uh, something you should check into would be the hail h-a-l-e rocket it was also known as the rotary rocket. This was a rocket that was produced in the 19th century. Very crude, but would work. I'm thinking of along the line of, say, if you look up for pictures, look up like a Chinese M107 millimeter rocket launchers, maybe um, Russian uh, Katusha rocket launchers. they're not that hard to produce um, they're being produced and or were being produced in large numbers inside Syria and Ukraine and used on the battlefield next up is the EFP or explosively formed projectile now what people don't realize this was not something that came out of nowhere during the Iraq war these were already being produced as landmines by conventional armies decades before Iraq. The British and the French had a version. The uh, British designation of it was the L-14A1 off-route mine. The EFP used by the insurgents is just a cruder version of it, but still just as effective. These are a mine that can be placed on the side of a roadway and used to take out heavy armored vehicles. It depends on the diameter of your uh, EFP. Check into information on them. They're very easy to manufacture. And the last one I have on here is smoke grenades. There's a lot of videos out there on how to produce your own uh, smoke producing uh, substances and different types of canisters and that stuff that you can use <clears throat> so that you can carry that substance and you know employ it when you need it some people make it for use in uh, paintball and airsoft well we can take that same concept 
maybe beef it up just a little bit and then we have our own smoke grenades that we can use for concealment and operations now as I said do not produce any of this stuff until after a conflict would begin but gather the information maybe examples of it demilled examples of it maybe some of the parts that type of thing but always follow the law do not do anything that is against the law that will get you arrested most of this stuff can be done in your basic machine shops some of it will require stuff that's a little bit more advanced but nothing beyond the capabilities that can be done by a resistance movement or <coughs> resistance movement and i say that because quite frankly the syrians are doing it or i should say the isis members are doing it the ukrainians have been doing it and a lot of this stuff even the Viet Cong did it in the jungle using hand tools so this stuff is not beyond the capabilities we are at a uh, great advantage over those earlier guerrilla movements and terrorist movements we have the internet we have a semi-free press you can still get a hold of printed copies of this stuff without the government showing up at your door we have access to modern machine equipment along with materials that we can get a hold of to have on hand so <clears throat> just follow the law learn what you can with the firearms build semi-automatic versions of it now so that you get an idea of what needs to be done so that if it would come down to you got to start producing the stuff in mass to produce to supply resistance troops to supply militia you already got your ideas on how to get around any problems that may uh, crop up now for all my engineer brothers and the patriot and militia movements always remember essayons